Um, so let me recap that uh, what we were trying to do is, or what I was trying to do was to convince you that the, the whole process of uh, obtaining solutions numerically uh, of differential equations uh, can be considered as uh, a simulation from some measure on the space of functions that would satisfy uh, the constraints imposed by the differential equations. We, we can define this, uh, this measure. Um, we have a scheme which basically def builds up a stochastic process um, and allows us to draw samples. And what I'm hoping to, to do today is to give you some examples of where this might be useful. So one way of thinking of this is that um, we, are, we basically solved what would be called the forward problem. So giving, given a set of boundary conditions, boundary values which we have, uh, initial values which we would have, um, parameter values which we would have, we would then want to forward simulate from this stochastic process uh, and draw realizations from it. And this little scheme here allows us to do that. Now, um, this is a very simple scheme. Um, hopefully you, you understood it certainly in, in outline, if, if not in detail. Um, but the sequential construction that we describe here has some nice properties. Um, the, the, the chief one is that we can prove the consistency of an estimator obtained from this stochastic process. Um, and I'm not going to go into the details of the proof, but suffice to say that because this is a sequential process, then we can use some of the sort of machinery of sequential Bayesian updating um, to update the mean functions and the covariant functions, both in the, that, that define both the states and the associated derivatives of the states. And because we have this sequential updating scheme, we can then, in essence, employ the standard arguments um, that are used in um, defining proofs of convergence for numerical integration schemes. But now, of course, this is probabilistic, so we have, um, we have to take into account expectations uh, with respect to the the actual stochastic process. But at the end of the day, um, it all boils down to using Gronwell's lemma and, um, and exploiting the uh, Lipschitz uh, condition as well. Um, and we get this proof. So, so this is all, all very nice. Um, and just to illustrate the construction, just to to hopefully allow you to visualize what's going on. Let's say that we have a um, couple of points here, which we've drawn from the process. And this is in the derivative space. Now what we can do is we can integrate to the, um, the actual state space, just using this GP integration. And once we've integrated that, we have this predictive uh, distribution, which we can then sample uh, a realization from the state. Then we can deterministically define the, um, the derivative, right? So, so the corresponding point in the derivative space, 
we can then, as I described, does that mine? Um, we can then, again, just do this projection, this GP integration, define the next predictive distribution, draw a sample of the state, and then project back deterministically, and on it goes. And it's as simple as that. And so what you can see here in this little cartoon is that as we progress, then, you know, the, the variance, the, the uncertainty uh, starts to shrink, certainly for a simple example like that. Okay, so that's the forward problem. And I guess in machine learning, we would call that the, the generative process. But the other uh, problem that we are, are interested in, of course, is the, what is called the inverse problem, a very generic term. But the inverse problem is the inverse of the forward problem, where we have an observation, we have a, some data which we've observed. And what we would now like to do is go backwards. We would like to infer, we would like to invert the process which we believe produced or generated that data. So we would then like to infer the initial conditions, the values perhaps at the boundaries, parameters which we don't know. We would like to infer these. And so now what I'm going to do is talk about a scheme that would allow us to address the inverse problem uh, in this setting. Now, of course, we're taking a Bayesian perspective, uh, so we want to define the posterior distribution um, over our unknowns. And if you remember, the posterior distribution that we defined was this thing here, where we now have a joint posterior distribution over all of our unknowns. The unknowns classically would be the parameters and so forth, but now we are also claiming that the function itself is an unknown. So we have this joint posterior conditional on our data and then any hyperparameters and so forth are associated with the stochastic process that, that, that allows us to, to forward simulate realizations of these functions. So the simplest scheme that we could come up with, a Metropolis-Hastings scheme, um, would look something like this. We can clearly, you all know, I, I guess someone described Metropolis-Hastings sampling, yeah, good. So th this, th this is the simplest case possible, but it actually hides um, a little bit of a, a difficulty, which I, I mentioned yesterday. So the first thing that we do is we, um, we would define a, a proposal uh, process for all of our unknowns, right? So I'm just going to call that generically Q, but it could be something clever like you know, an HMC process or what have you, but whatever. We, we would have some proposal um, mechanism that would allow us to propose some of the um, unknowns that we're interested in. Now, conditional on this proposed set of parameters, we now would like to use this generative process that we have developed to now propose a realization of the, uh, the function um, that, that's going to pop out of the system of differential equations. Uh, and this is obviously going to be conditional on um, the proposed set of uh, parameters, initial conditions, and so forth. So what that means then is that we're going to have a proposal distribution. If you remember, the generative process can be described as the joint probability of our function and 
all this stuff here associated with the finite grid, right? And then given parameters and so forth. Now, the conditional distribution for the function state conditioned on the sort of skeleton grid, we know is a Gaussian process. But the distribution associated with this thing is, who knows? We could probably get it actually for simple linear systems, but then for simple linear systems, we wouldn't need to, to be bothering doing something like this. So immediately, we now have a, a problem because in the overall uh, target distribution, right, we're going to have this thing here, which is intractable. Um, but we can use a kind of slate of hand and, and we can dip into the ABC. Uh, I guess most of you were here to, uh, when Christian Robert gave his uh, tutorial lecture on approximate Bayesian computation. Um, so we can actually dip into the, the ABC toolkit and, and actually just use the, 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 the scheme that they, they, they use in ABC. We have this measure which needs to appear in our Hastings ratio to allow us to define a Markov, uh, a transition kernel, which would uh, have an invariant distribution, of, um, which would be this here. Um, but we have this intractable distribution. But we can simulate from the intractable distribution. So because we can simulate from this, we can use this as our conditional proposal for u, right, condition, or u prime conditioned on theta prime. And again, because this appears as part of the, the likelihood in the prior, then what happens is, is that the proposal or the, the forward proposal in the denominator cancels out with the component um, that appears in the numerator from the likelihood. And so, as long as we can simulate from this, which we can, we can then, that this irritating um, distribution disappears from our Hastings ratio, and all that we end up with is just going to be the product of the prior and then the likelihood. So the likelihood of our observed data conditioned on uh, what I've written here is some nonlinear transformation of uh, the states of the system. Um, and you'll see, you'll see an example of that in, uh, later on. And that's it. Pretty simple. Um, pretty simple, probably pretty inefficient as well. And again, I would hope to see um, some nice papers on um, infinite dimensional Hamiltonian Monte Carlo on uh, a Hilbert manifold right, associated with, with these things here. So where's Mike Betancourt? He's hiding. Where is he? I saw him a minute ago. No, he's definitely hiding. <laughs> I'll take a note of that. Um, but yeah, so the, 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 this is a very simple scheme. It's probably one that's not going to really scale terribly well, um, but it works. And, you know, it shows that we can we can construct a transition kernel and associated Markov chain to solve the inverse problem. Uh, but again, I would hope to see from you guys and Mike Betancourt, um, you know, some, some far more clever, more efficient uh, sampling schemes for this here. Okay, so that's the forward problem. That's the inverse problem. Uh, we've got solutions for them. 
Now what we need to do is start having a look at, at some examples. Any questions before we look at a couple of examples? All pretty clear? Okay, we're going to go and look at the, um, the partial differential equation which is described, so this is just in one dimension, so it's going to be du of xt by dt is just equal to some constant, which we're not going to know, and du uh, xt dx2. Okay, so kind of maths 101 equation, and we're just working in uh, one dimension. The boundary conditions are such that at time equals zero, the, uh, the value of u um, for all x times zero is a kind of sine function of x, something like that. And the values at uh, the boundaries, we're just going to hold them fixed. Okay, so we'll just set them to a constant value. So I'm going to show you uh, examples of us solving the forward problems. So in other words, sampling solutions of, uh, so sampling u of x t that satisfies this equation and the associated boundary conditions. And then we'll look at the inverse problem where we observe some data, so we make some measurements right, along this grid um, across time. Um, and these measurements, of course, have some sort of observation error. And from those measurements, from these Ys, we want to obtain a posterior distribution over K, over kappa, which we don't know. Okay? That's what we want to do. So here's an example. Now, the, the reason that we use this example is because there is an exact analytic solution. So we have the ground truth to kind of do a comparison with. And I think this is quite a, a, an interesting example. So this is, a, this is a sample of, so this is one draw from the posterior over u of x t, right, where x runs from 0 to 1, and we've, and we've basically ran time for, you know, 0.25 of a time unit. So that kind of looks about right. right. So we get this diffusion, and this kind of flattening over time. And if I just take a slice, right, so if I just look at the, uh, the sample right, at this time point here, okay, we see this, but we need to look a bit closer. So if I remember the, the green line, let me just get this right. Uh, Blue is the coarse mesh. Uh, ah, there he is. <laughs> you know how to make an entrance. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the actual solution, the analytic solution is in green. And what you can see, hopefully, is that as the the mesh, so as our f uh, of 1 to n uh, gets finer, then because of the proof of consistency, then we should start to see, one, any bias starting to reduce, and secondly, the uh, uncertainty associated with the solution starting to shrink. And so we can see that here. Uh, we can probably see it a little bit better uh, at, at, at this time here. 
you know, here we've got the, the true solution, and here we've got, you know, the coarse grid, and then this is a, a much more refined grid. And what's kind of comforting is that even with the coarse grid, the inflation of uncertainty, the inflation of the posterior variance ensures that the, um, the analytic solution is within the error bars or within the high density regions of the posterior. So this is great. This, this shows us that our forward uh, model, the stochastic process, the sampling procedure, is doing uh, what it should do. And this is great. Okay, so the next thing is, um, of course, we've now conditioned an, on, an, on the true value of k. So now what we're going to do, again, is we'll just do a little simulation. And this is, the, 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 this is something in the uh, uncertainty quantification or the inverse problems li literature, which is called an inverse... Anyone know it? It's called an inverse crime. Because what I'm doing is I'm simulating data from the exact model. And I'm not taking into account the fact that there may well be a mismatch between the model and the reality. If you remember, I mentioned Kennedy and O'Hagan's work. And the engineers, uh, they call this an inverse crime. Um, so I'm going to commit an inverse crime here. I'm going to generate data from the model. Um, and I'm not going to have any mismatch. So one of the things that, that, uh, that we did do is um, because we knew that our inverse problems colleagues would shout crime, um, is that we, we actually defined, so, so over three dimensions, um, we would define k as being a function of x, right? So we would generate data from a process where the conductivity, if this, if this is temperature, um, was not homogeneous. But our model was such that we assumed it was. So we have this reality model mismatch. And, and how does our inference process accommodate that? But that, that, that's another story. I, I just really now want to be happy in committing an inverse crime and just studying the, uh, the effects of um, defining this posterior over this one unknown. And here are the results. So as I said, we had some data generated from the true model and our only unknown was the thermal conductivity, this homogeneous thermal conductivity uh, across the whole material. Now, the right-hand plot is the one to look at. So this posterior here, so the, the, the value uh, of kappa that was used to generate the data was 1. This posterior here, right, in green, is obtained by using the analytic solution. So there's no discretization error. We just plug in the, the analytic value, the analytic value for the, uh, for the temperature at each uh, spatial and temporal point. And as you would expect, because we're committing crime, the posterior is bang on, you know, the mode of the posterior is bang on the the generating value of, uh, of kappa, and we've got a nice, uh, yeah, everything looks as it should be. We then used a numerical method. We just used a standard uh, forward solver. Uh, I think it was just Crank Nicholson that we used. And we, we employed quite a coarse grid. And so when we do that, and we just forget about the, so, so we, we forget about the, the, the fact that there is going to be uncertainty associated with the discretization. So we just lay all that to the side and do what 
typically is done in practice at the moment. And here's the posterior that we get. Now this is really disturbing. One, because it's biased. And two, because the uncertainty associated with that posterior uh, is such, right, it's so concentrated around the untrue value uh, that it doesn't even cover, you know, the, the, it, it, the, the, the generating value is, is implausible according to this, this posterior here. So I, I think this, 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 this is a... This, this is a great, uh, a great example um, that, you know, it's incontrovertible. You know, if you, that, that, that's what you get, and it's wrong. So you would, you, know, you would come up with misleading inferences. If, on the other hand, we accept the fact that we have a, a, an error associated with the discretization, and we accommodate that in our overall uncertainty. And so rather than using crank Nicholson or whatever on a coarse grid, we'll use our simulation-based scheme on a coarse grid. And here's the corresponding posterior. So this is the posterior over kappa that we get when we um, we don't use a numerical solution, we, simply, we use this probabilistic solution. And, and what do you see? What, what, what do you see? Zero. Sorry? Zero you see a posterior distribution. I was hoping for a little bit more insight than that, but that's a good start. Posterior distribution, what else? It includes the true value. It includes the true value. The spread is really big. OK, so the generating value, um, you know, it's, it's in the high density region. But the level of uncertainty, and if you look at the, the scale here in comparison to here, is really high. But that's good. It's good because. It's being honest. It's saying, well, you know, the, I'm, I'm pretty uncertain. Um, but the stuff that's in here, you know, is fairly plausible. And thankfully, the, the generating value happens to be there. Whereas if you use the same grid and use standard numerical methods, then we get this erroneous um, posterior distribution here. Now, if we refine the grid, then what should we see? Because of this, we know that the process is consistent. What should we start to see? The error bars start to shrink. And that's exactly what we would want, right? We would want to see the consistency reflected in the concentration of the posterior measure around the generating value. And that's exactly what we see. So as we go from a coarse grid to not such a coarse grid, we can start to see that, that the, the, you know, the measure starts to concentrate around the, the generating value. And as we go to an even more refined grid, um, we get this here. So th this is a, a, a nice example of the dangers associated with not taking the uncertainty induced by discretization error into account. Uh, and it shows, obviously, I'm going to show you a, a nice example like this. But it illustrates the, the consistency of, and the coherence uh, of, of the, the, the posterior inferences that we can make uh, with regards to this. So that's great. Everyone happy with that? I know it's Saturday morning. Right, which means it was Friday night last night, so we're going to be a little bit lethargic, and I'm allowing for that. But, um, okay, there we are. So this is all good. So let me give you a few other illustrative examples just to kind of hammer the point home. Um, 
How many of you have heard of the Lorentz 63 model? You want to describe it? Just tell us what it's what it is. They're like oscillators, <coughs> and then at some point the chaotic behavior takes over and it starts behaving ugly. Right. So, so the Lorentz the Lorentz 63 models are extremely simple models. Um, which were used um, to, to, uh, as very kind of coarse representations in studying um, things like weather patterns. But as uh, our friend from Finland, Finland um, pointed out, these dynamics, although they are deterministic, the well they have these these attractors associated with them which induces this what is called chaotic behavior and so 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 these are this is a system of uh equations here so we've just got three so the state is defined by, by these three coordinates really really simple an initial value problem uh, and if we set the parameters to magic values then what happens is, is that trajectories that are perturbed, even just a small amount, right, right at you know, the very start, will diverge uh, very, very quickly or exponentially fast. So we thought this would be an interesting, um, an interesting example to look at um, as far as the, the probabilistic setting was concerned. So let me ask you a few questions. So if, if you coded this up in MATLAB, right, you use the same initial values and you use the exact same, uh, so you use the, these initial values and you use these parameters and you ran OD45, okay? What would you get? Well, you get a trace and you'd be happy with that. What happens if you run ODE45 again? You get the exact same trace. And if you just, just to make sure that you, the same trace, you, you run ODE45 again, what would you get? The same trace, okay? If we now, code this up and run the probabilistic solver, but I'm not going to use that language. I'm going to say that we, we sample values of u, v, and w that are consistent with this system here from our, our, our posterior measure. So let's draw a sample from this distribution here. We get a solution. We plot it. What if we do it again? What are we going to get? A different answer. Now, if it was a really simple system, that different answer probably wouldn't be that much different because this measure is probably going to be concentrated. But for a system like this, what do we see? Well, this is what we see. So here's a hundred samples drawn from this very, very simple system. The initial values are exactly the same. The, discretize, the discretization level is exactly the same. The three parameter values are exactly the same. And what do we see? You're looking a bit lively, so you might as well answer it. They start to diverge. So by running a deterministic solver, we wouldn't see this. So if we ran a deterministic solver 100 times, we wouldn't see this divergence. But we see it here because we are sampling. 
Now, we haven't done any further work in this, but I, I think this opens a door to the study of chaotic systems like, like you know, turbulence and so forth and fluid flow. Um, because now we, we, we can, you know, well, what this is saying is, is that, yeah, we're pretty certain that this is the behavior, you know, round about here under these conditions. But then we really start getting uncertain and the uncertainty grows as it should because of the, the, the divergence um, induced by this, this chaotic process. So this is quite a nice uh, proof of the concept um, of the forward problem being uh, probabilistic or endowed with these probabilistic semantics. Here's another example um, which I kind of like. Um, so this is Navier Stokes, very classical uh, system of partial differential equations describing velocity field um, in a fluid. Um, so he, here's the, the classical equations. Here is the conditions. So this is uh, conservation of mass and so forth. So um, I won't bore you with, with the details, um, but they're, they're, they're quite technical. Um, so there's two ways that we could solve this. There's two ways we could set up the posterior uh, to, to sample realizations of you. The first one is, is that we could uh, you know, define our prior covariance, which, which would... Uh, would define the covariance structure between the states, between the states and the, the time derivatives, between the states and the first order uh, spatial derivatives, and then the second order spatial derivatives. So we could do that. The other thing that we can do um, is th th there are what's called uh, spectral projection methods where we can convert this system to a, a system of coupled ordinary differential equations. And then we can use our probabilistic sampling scheme to, um, to generate samples from, from, of, of, uh, of functions that satisfy those systems of, of ordinary differential equations. And so that's what we did in this example here. So we ended up on a 64 by 64 gridded torus. Uh, when we convert that system of partial differential equations to system of coupled differential equations, we end up with something like 16,000 coupled differential equations. And, um, okay, so cut a very long story short. Here are six samples drawn from our... Uh, are posterior over the states. And um, so remember that the, the solution for Navier-Stokes is, is going to be, so that this, this is a sort of flattened out torus. Right? So this is the spatial components, and then there's gonna be a temporal component as well. So the only way that we can really view these samples is kind of in a video. So if I just hopefully play these. So these are samples drawn from our posterior measure. Now, um, you should see some sort of um, variability between the, these samples, but there's not terribly much. Uh, and that's because, um, well, we were working in a, a fairly high Reynolds number regime, so you know, th there was no real onset of, of turbulence. But we did uh, create we, 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 we ran an example somewhere, um, yeah, with a very low Reynolds number, which means that we, you know, there would be an onset of, of turbulence. And so, so this is it here. So this is just two samples. And you should see 
some variability. Actually, a big bit of variability just shortly. There you go. Okay, so, so this is really nice. So again, let, let's just remember that these are two samples, right? These are just two objects drawn from this measure. So, pretty cool. And one other example of a, a chaotic system. So this, 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 this is, an, uh, I'm not going to, again, bore you with the details, but it's just a partial differential equation, which is sometimes used to model flame fronts. Um, so it's, it, it, it's, in, it's defined in one dimension and then over time. So you could imagine if we were to kind of create a movie of this, you know, you would, you could imagine how this would be representing the generation of flames. And, and here's, here's 15 samples from the posterior. And again, if you look, maybe I should have showed you this last night when you were having some beer, but you can definitely see the variability um, associated with the, the overall process. Okay, um, so let me, before I conclude uh, this part of the lecture, is, um, is just perhaps look at some things that, that, that might actually be, be useful for this. So I alluded that Mike Betancourt would probably, you know, develop some really fancy hybrid Monte Carlo scheme on an infinite dimensional manifold that would allow us to, to sample these objects very efficiently. And so I thought, well, how, does this actually, how, how could this be, be useful for us? Well, if you remember, now I, I've, I'm using X here, and this should really be U, right? So we've got this, this conditional, the conditional distribution of U given F is, is a Gaussian process, okay? Now what that means then is that the Fisher information, uh, did Mike cover... Fisher Rao metrics and so forth. Mike, you didn't. You're fired. <laughs> Come to my office tomorrow morning. Um, um, so there, there, there is a, in Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, you have this mass matrix. Well, there's a way of uh, having locally adaptive methods um, by exploiting the, um, the natural metric structure uh, of, the, of, the, of the space of probability distributions. And one way, one, one metric structure uh, would be the fischer rao And the Fisher information, which defines that metric for a Gaussian process, just turns out to be this, this thing here. So it's the derivative of the mean function with respect to the parameters of the variables that you're interested in. Um, and then it's, so, so it's this inner product uh, between these two objects and it's weighted by the inverse of the, the covariance structure. Now what's really nice about, or what's potentially nice about this uh, and I'm just going to skip over this because maybe this is the wrong audience for, 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 for these ideas. But, hello. Oh, I scared her. Um, so engineers and applied mathematicians uh, want to use these Riemann manifold Hamiltonian Monte Carlo schemes to, to sample, you know, from objects like this here. The problem that they have is that, first of all, they need to compute this metric tensor, and then they need to compute um, derivatives of this metric tensor. And what that means for them is that they need to use 
adjoint uh, solution schemes, or if they're not clever enough and they don't use adjoint solutions, uh, solution schemes, they actually just solve the sensitivity equations directly, then what ends up, what, what, what ends up or what, what was originally a reasonably simple problem now becomes a much larger and more complex problem to solve. And it therefore makes these manifold methods um, pretty limited in scope uh, when it comes to um, large-scale PDE systems like Navier-Stokes. But with this here, all that we're doing, right, if, if we're assuming that the solution at a particular point is given, that it's data, then the gradients and the metric structure can be defined analytically. And the higher order derivatives can also be defined analytically as well. And it only requires one forward solve or one forward simulation. Um, and that's a huge, that, what that means is that, that, that these methods could now be feasible for large scale partial differential equations. Um, so so th th this could be considered as a sort of proxy geometry uh, for the, um, for the actual geometry that, 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 that would be associated with, with these equations. But anyway, th this, is, uh, this is probably beyond the, um, the remit of this, of this lecture. So the, the final example I'm going to give you kind of captures everything here. And it's, uh, it's a model that uh, is, is reasonably well studied, and it's one that, that I, I, I have... Uh, biologist uh, collaborators, cell biologist collaborators who, who study these uh, cellular transduction pathways and they use mathematical models to try and make some sense of the complexities of the, uh, of the cellular signaling. And so this, um, this system here uh, basically describes, again I'm not going to talk about the biology, but it basically describes the reaction uh, and, and the communication uh, of four proteins, one, two, three, four, um, after they are stimulated, or after the cell is stimulated by a particular uh, hormone, and it's EPO. Anyone heard of EPO? Anyone cycle? So I... I I was giving this talk in Austin, Texas, and I made a little joke about EPO, but it clearly didn't go down too well there because of a certain rather infamous resident uh, of Austin. But anyway, the, 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 so this system of equations basically describes the, the transduction of the signal, right, which is initiated by the, uh, you know, the presence of EPO at the cellular membrane and the cascade of events right, by the activation of these proteins. And what happens is, is that EPO, I said I wasn't going to, well, I'm not going to talk about the biology, but this is just a little cartoon. So you've got the cell membrane, and then you've got, uh, you, you, you've got a sort of um, contactor. So EPO comes along, binds, and then we have all of these proteins, U1, U2, U3, U4. And this initiates a cascade, right, which um, then initiates some process in the cell nucleus. Now, these proteins aren't just hanging around in the cytoplasm um, waiting to be activated. They're all over the place. And so when this protein is activated, then a signal, some sort of signal is sent out for this protein to be transported you know, in, into a particular region of the cell. It's activated and so forth. So these differential equations describe what our biologists know about 
about this process. And one of the things that they, they know is that there is a, a, a translocation process. So in other words, there's a delay, right, from the signal being received by this protein and this protein being in the, the right location for it to be activated. But what that process is, they don't really understand, but they can represent it using this, this sort of time delay. And so what we then end up with is a, a coupled system uh, of time delayed uh, differential equations. And we make some measurements. So the cell biologists are very clever people and uh, they can actually measure the amounts of protein right, that is produced over a time course. But they're not that clever because they can't measure directly and specifically each of these proteins. They can only measure the sort of total sum of them just because of technical reasons. And so what that means is that we don't directly observe the, the states U1 to U4, but what we observe is something like this. So we, we observe um, the total amount of U1 and U3 uh, scaled by you know, some uh, factor based on the efficiency of the antibodies that are used and so forth. Okay, so we have a nonlinear transformation of the states to our actual data. Um, so what, what you see here um, is the data, the red dots, uh, and you see actual samples drawn from the posterior measure uh, associated with that system of differential equations. And these are the uh, posteriors, so these are the bivariate posteriors right, for each of the, the parameters. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, yeah, nine, nine parameters. So along here we've got the marginal distributions. So the red indicates the, the posterior that we've inferred and the black is the prior distribution that we placed on these kinetic rates. And, uh, and you can see that there, there, there are identifiability issues. So for example here, right, th th there's absolutely no information in the data about alpha. Right? So the prior and the posterior uh, are, are, are incident with each other. But these posteriors, again, reflect the additional uncertainty in these solutions. So we're not just taking one draw. We're not just taking you know, one deterministic solution. We, we, we're, we're taking into account the fact that, for example, with this here, we've only got one data point. And so therefore, again, a deterministic solver would just give us one solution, but you know, our uncertainty because of the lack of data uh, is, is reflected here. And of course, it's coherently propagated uh, to the posterior inference over all of the parameters. So this is, this is, uh, this is, this is nice. And I should say that we had to, um, I mean, we had to use a lot of tricks uh, to sample from, from this posterior. So we had to use parallel tempering and, and all manner of good things. But that's pretty much it. So what, what I've tried to do is convince you that um, the issue of model and reality mismatch is important, and that's something that Kennedy and O'Hagan addressed in, in their sort of seminal paper from, from a decade ago. And what I've argued is, is that, well, in actual fact, there's, all, there's still another source of uncertainty associated with the dis discrete nature of the solution of the system of equations, and that we need to account for and uh, take a, 
take cognizance of that mismatch. And what we've done is we've exploited a, a very simple probabilistic construction which defines an appropriate measure over the, 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 the space of, of, of functions. And this opens up a whole load of really cool things to do. Um, and, and a few of us spent about, I don't know, three quarters of an hour on the board yesterday talking about some of these things. So the fact that we've got an, an inflation of uncertainty right, in discrete solutions, well, we can assess that now. And it means that we can, we can now, in a, you know, in a principled way, start to think about, you know, ask questions like, well, do we really need to refine the mesh? Do, do, you know, do, do we need to run this for another 10 days right, just to, to, uh, to, to use a fine mesh and drive the error down? Well, we can see what the error, we can see what the error uh, is doing um, to, to our posterior inferences. Um, yeah, so we have this Monte Carlo solution um, for differential equations. And so all the sort of statistical machinery, all the good stuff uh, that, you know, that we have in the probabilistic modeling statistical inference toolkit can be... Uh, can, can, can be used um, in this here. And uh, I think that's probably it for, for this. So that this, this, was the, uh, this is the end of the first lecture. Any questions? classical integrator to, to get a solution from initial values and you have uncertainty associated with the initial values and you sample actually from, from this distribution. Would you get a sensible distribution of the solution? Yeah, I, that, so that's a very good question. So, so the, the question was, um, let's say that we've got a, an initial value problem. And that's the solution. And you know, this, this is the initial value which we're given. What happens if we randomize this? Well, if we randomize it, then um, clearly, you know, if, if we run the solver multiple times, then we're going to get different solutions. Um, what this doesn't do, though, that, so this is, only, this is only adding uncertainty into the initial value. And you're hoping that that uncertainty is going to be propagated through the integration process. Um, but there's no associated measure with it. So th 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 this, this, this is standard practice. Right? So you, we would waggle the initial values, we would waggle the, the boundary values and so forth. Um, but actually getting, as I said, a measure out of that, it's not entirely clear how, how we would do it in a consistent and a coherent manner. Good question though. Any other questions? Mike, you're not fired. I decided I'll I'll keep you on for another <coughs> another week. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, carry on. You didn't quite talk about it a lot, but what is the but what does the kernel mean in this method? Like, um, <coughs> the kernel solutions? Yeah, so that, that's a, a very good question, very good practical question. How does the kernel affect the solutions? And clearly, it's going to have a very big impact to, to the solutions. And, um, and I, th I think, I think for, for an application like this, you're really forced to think very carefully about uh, the kernel that you're going to use. The good thing is that you've got a lot of information about the functionals, right? You know, about the space. And so, you, you know, you've, you've got a whole system of equations. Um, and so you can use that, you know, the, the, the very fact that for initial value problems, we, we need to have Lipschitz continuity immediately. You know, that, that, that tells us there has to be smoothness. 
and we can embed that or we can, we can use that to guide our choice uh, of the, the actual kernel. What, what I didn't talk about was um, actually doing inference over, say, the parameters of that kernel. Uh, and in the, in the last example, we did that. So, so we, 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 um, we just put that, you know, the hyperparameters uh, as a parameter that, that had to be estimated. And this now leads on to my next lecture, which I've got 20 minutes to give. Is that right? Okay, uh, it leads on to the first part of my next lecture, um, which is that, you know, if, if, if we think about it, what we've got is we've got data, which we observe. We've then got this unknown function u. And then we're going to have a set of parameters associated with the kernel. So we want to do infer you know we want to do inference over everything. So we want to do inference over uh, over this as well. And what we found in the um, the EPO example was, and, and this shouldn't be a surprise to to a lot of people working in machine learning because this is a very well known problem, is that because we have this hierarchic structure then there isn't that much information in the data about this here, right? So constraining this is, isn't um, terribly easy. And actually sampling this thing efficiently uh, is actually very difficult. Um, and so this next lecture that I'm going to give is going to address this problem in a more generic uh, machine learning setting. So shall I just continue? And as we started a little bit later, can I maybe run on for another 10 minutes? You don't look happy about that. Oh, yeah, you're smiling. Good. Um, just so, I mean, we might not need an extra 10 minutes, but it, it would be nice just to try and, uh, and get through it. But, uh, or just to get through the very first point that hopefully I'll make. But what you're going to miss is how to play Russian roulette um, safely. So, so don't play Russian roulette. Um, so what I'm going to talk about now then is, uh, so this is a little bit more about MCMC, and um, in particular about a very specific problem that's associated, uh, that, that, that's the bane of, of most machine learning people's lives. Um, so, so this is quite, uh, quite an appropriate thing. Uh, so the stuff that you're not going to hear about, the Russian roulette, uh, is joint work with one of my PhD students, Anne-Marie, um, a research fellow who's going to be coming to Warwick to join us, Dan Simpson. Um, I don't know who this guy is. I can't remember. Uh, and Eva Chadi from, from Michigan. But I'm not going to talk about their work. We're going to talk about um, these two things here. Right? I'm only going to have time to scratch the surface on talking about the pseudo-marginal MCNC scheme uh, and how we can, can use it to solve a very long-standing problem in hierarchic Gaussian process models. So let me rush, well not rush through, but let me try and, and get through it reasonably um, timiously. So I think you've probably got the message by now that you know, it's a challenge to carry out Bayesian inference uh, accounting for uncertainty in model parameters and making model-based predictions on out-of-sample data. And that's really the main, or one of the main stock and trades of machine learning applications. And exact posterior marginalization is hard. It's a difficult problem. Um, you know, writing, a, writing your code for, for a sampler 
uh, or, or you know, finding out that you've got exact conditionals, you can run a Gibbs sampler. You know, it means very little because the chances are that the mixing is going to be dreadfully poor, it's going to be dreadfully inefficient. And if you take it seriously, right, um, you know, if, 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 if you really take it seriously and, and worry about um, what your MCMC is telling you, then you realise just how difficult these problems are. So I, I had, um, I have a collaboration with some cancer biologists and, and they came to me some quite some time ago now and they said, oh, you, you, you do all this Bayesian stuff and we, we've got a number of possible, dis possible um, descriptions of a signalling pathway that's associated with carcinogenesis. And so it's very important. Um, could, could you maybe, if we gave you a number of models could, or descriptions, could you convert them into a mathematical model and do this Bayesian stuff and tell us which model is, is, is the best supported? Um, so, of course, I said, absolutely, we can do that. And, and so over a course of about a year, you know, we sat down, we worked out what the models were. Um, and then we developed the models, we coded them up, and then we worked out how to do the MCMC over them. And what, what we were trying to do was to estimate base factors. And I tell you, the amount of sleep I lost every time I looked at over my PhD student's shoulder and saw how badly his Markov chain was mixing and getting these estimates of the base factors. Because what these biologists, what these cell biologists, these cancer biologists said they were going to do is that they would bet the farm, right? Their latest grant, they would devote a substantial amount of the funding to getting a postdoc, getting the experiments done, getting the lab set up to, to test the hypothesis. So it really focused my attention on how good the Markov chain was running because I knew that if, you know, if, if we made any erroneous inferences, uh, it would be extremely costly for, for, for these guys. So, um, Doing MCMC and doing it properly uh, and seriously is, is, is very hard. So I'm going to use a very simple example here, and it's one that you all know because it's, I think it appears every year in NIPS. Uh, and it's a simple binary probit regression model. What did I do? How many of you know about the binary probit regression model? Don't be shy. Well, you should. Coming from Zubin's lab. So, um, so I'm going to use probit regression just really as an illustration or to, to show you what the issues are and then how we can actually use this uh, kind of advanced MCMC methodology as one way of addressing it. Can everyone still hear me? Can... This is... Yeah. So we're going to stick with Gaussian processes um, as hierarchic statistical models. Um, and what we're going to show is that uh, we can actually use Monte Carlo-based integration um, to marginalise um, out these, uh, these hyperparameters. So, let's just remind ourselves. So, X, we're going to have a set of covariates, a set of features, and there's going to be N of them. So, we've got N input vectors. Um, and associated with each of these, we're going to have some binary label, a minus one or a plus one. Uh, so these are our responses. So this is a classification problem, if you want. And what we'll do is we'll use a Gaussian process classifier. 
So we will associate um, a realization from a, an n-dimensional realization from a Gaussian process prior. We'll call this f. So this is an n-dimensional vector um, which is produced, uh, which can be sampled from this Gaussian process prior. Um, and the covariance function is going to have a set of parameters. Um, now, the data, because it's binary, we're just going to model it um, in the classical way, or the sort of probe it regression way. We're going to say that the, the, the probability of the ith uh, discrete label conditional on the uh, ith component of the, the latent function, the Gaussian process function, is just going to be modelled uh, in this form here, where this is just a probit function. Okay, so this is just the, uh, the CDF of the, of the normal distribution. Um, and we're going to assume that conditional on F, uh, all our observations are independent. So the joint density of the, our observed data, conditional on our latent function, is uh, just this product form here. Now, this model is hierarchic, and I'm sure you know, those of you who have been at NIPS have seen this model umpteen times. Um, but why our data is conditioned on f, and f is conditioned on theta, and the, the input's x. And if we claim to be Bayesians, um, so we want to do Bayesian machine learning, then any subsequent out-of-sample predictions, y star given uh, a new set of features, uh, x star, um, we would use this measure here. Probability, the predictive probability of y star given all of our data, x, y, and x star. And the way that we would obtain that is we would, well, we've got the probit likelihood for... Uh, what we want to predict given this latent function. We've got the conditional prior, this is a Gaussian process prior, of f star given f and theta. And then we've got our posterior distribution over the latent function values, so the n values and the um, hyperparameters conditional on the data. And all that we're going to do is we're just going to marginalize over f star, f, and theta. Well, that's what we would do. That, that, that's what we would like to do. Um, and what we see... Uh, so, of course, the, the, the problem that we've got now is that this posterior is not analytic, right? Because we've got a non-Gaussian uh, non <coughs> likelihood term which really screws things up when, when we, we then convert our, our GP prior and non-Gaussian likelihood into a posterior. And so the, the sort of things that we see in the machine learning literature is um, a lot of uh, work that's done on, on getting good approximations to, well, it's not even this joint likelihood, it's the, it's the, the posterior of F conditional on Y and theta. And so there are things like the Laplace approximation. And again, you heard Hovard Roux talking about INLA, which is a sort of nested Laplace approximation for latent Gaussian models. There's a whole load of variational work. Um, so Neil, Neil Lawrence does, does an enormous amount uh, of really cool stuff on, on looking at really nice variational approximations. And then, of course, there are a whole load of... Uh, um, approximations based on expectation propagation. They're all approximations. So let's just bear that in mind. They're all approximations. And they're all conditional approximations conditioned on theta. So we still, you know, the, the, the hooker is that we can get an approximate posterior for our latent functions, but it's conditioned on this this, this parameter which is further up the hierarchy. And so typically what is done in practice uh, in, in most machine learning papers is that we would, 
maximize the approximate marginal likelihood that comes from, from these approximations. And we would just then, rather than marginalizing um, over theta, we would just take a point estimate of it. Um, and that usually is, 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 you know, suffices for, for most things. But today, I'm going to be a really, really strict Bayesian. And I'm going to say, no, that's not good enough. I need this predictive posterior here, and nothing else is going to satisfy me. So that means that we need to resort to Markov chain Monte Carlo methods to characterize this joint posterior over f and theta. So if we can define a Markov chain to allow us to, to sample from this uh, joint posterior, then we can make predictions just based on a, a Monte Carlo estimate of this predictive uh, posterior here. Because this is a probit function, this conditional uh, is Gaussian, and so that we can get, we, we, we can work out this, uh, this integral analytically. So all that we need to do is just draw samples from our posterior um, and then just take a, a weighted average and then make predictions based on that. So that's all we need to do. Well, it turns out that this is a hellish problem, in fact. Um, because if we try to sample directly, uh, jointly, so if we try to propose a theta and then propose an f, right, and then accept that, um, then the, the rate of, uh, of acceptance is, is, is going to be very small. And as the dimensionality of this function increases, um, then the, um, the acceptance rate just falls through the floor. So the pragmatic solution is to say, well, we want to draw samples from this, uh, this joint posterior. What we can do is we can set up a sort of Gibbs scheme where we would first of all sample from the conditional posterior for f, given the data and the current values of the hyperparameters. And again, there's a slew of methods that would allow you to do that. Elliptic slice sampling is really cool. Uh, hybrid Monte Carlo, but the Riemannian manifold hybrid Monte Carlo is the way to go. Correct, Mike? Mike knows where his salary comes from, so he's agreeing with me. Um, but that's all good. I mean, and, and th th this, is, this is all standard fare. Th this, is, this is easy. This is the difficult bit. There's now sampling from P of theta given F and Y. And it's a very well-known problem in the, statistics, in the computational statistics literature. And some, you know, some of really senior people like Gareth Roberts and so forth have invested a lot of time in trying to, and, and Shaoli Meng had a beautiful paper, red paper just recently, uh, on these ideas of reparameterizing. Um, closer to home in the machine learning community, uh, Ian Murray uh, and Ryan Adams again had a lovely, uh, I think it was a NIPS paper, um, looking again at, uh, at ways of sampling from, from, from this thing here, uh, again using uh, reparameterizations. But the problem is, is that the reparameterizations are kind of bespoke for the particular problem. And what we would like is, so because I, you know, probit regression, you know, it's, it's, it's a nice problem, but the things that I'm working on, like these things here, which are extremely high dimensional, extremely complex, it's very difficult to, to have any clue at all as to what the sort of reparameterization would be. Um, so we're really looking for a methodology that, that, that's much more generic than, as I said, a kind of bespoke reparameterization of the, uh, the latent functions. The reason that this is difficult um, is the following. If I look at the marginal distribution of theta given y, so where we've integrated out f, then here is the marginal distribution of theta given y. 
If I look at this distribution, so the conditional distribution of theta, given a realization of, of uh, the latent function, then it looks something like this, depending on this, the, the sort of reparameterization that's used. What's, what's the problem you see here? I know what the problem is. Coffee's just arrived, and I'm keeping you from it. But, but this is good stuff, so I'm going to hold you for, for a, little bit a little bit longer. What's the problem? Well, the or did I just catch your eye? I thought you were actually going to give me an answer. Anyone want to offer an answer? So, 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 let, so, so let's look at this, this conditional distribution here. And let's say that we took the full force of HMC, right? Doesn't matter how efficient HMC is. Look at the support. It's, it's going to explore this posterior really, really well. But it's not making any impact at all on, you know, what's really important. And this is the big problem, is getting a reparameterization so that these conditionals reflect more the, the, the actual marginal. So we want, to, we want to try and solve this problem generically. Any ideas how you would do it? Hamiltonian wanted, who said that? You, you say them. You know how to, to please somebody, don't you? <laughs> well, the answer is no, you wouldn't. Uh, because of this issue here. Well, what you would do is, well, what, what am I interested in? This is, oh, don't. This is what I'm interested in. I'm interested in the marginal. P of theta given y. That's what I want. That's what I want to sample from. But I can't do that because I can't marginalize the joint posterior. Well, I'm going to show you that we can. And it's a really cool, really, it's, it's awesome how we do it. And this is how we do it. So we're interested in sampling from this marginal posterior here. But as I said, to, to obtain this marginal posterior, we need to compute this integral. So remember, this is a product over probit functions. Uh, this is our prior. Um, so we're kind of snookered. Um, but if we could do it, then this is what we would we would come up with. We, we, we would devise a transition kernel uh, comprised of, well, the marginal likelihood uh, and the associated prior. But we can't get the marginal likelihood. It's a bit annoying. Well, we could just resort to approximations. I'm going to show you that we can use expectation propagation. We can use variational approximations and whatever other approximations are kicking around. And we can still retain the exactness of MCMC. And this is pretty cool, I think. What we do is the following. And it's based on a um, method uh, which is called the... How many of you have heard of the pseudo-marginal approach? Very few of you are good. So you're learning something. So in the statistics literature, in, in the computational statistics literature, there is a huge amount of work that's going on uh, by people like Arnold Doucet, Christophe Andrew, Gareth Roberts. Um, who else? Mike, who, who else is working in this area? All the great and the good. Chris Sherlock, and so forth. And what, what, what is this pseudo-marginal thing? Well, if we could get an estimate of the marginal 
some sort of approximation, some estimate. And we just plug that into our Hastings ratio. Well, this is an approximation, this is an estimate, so the transition kernel is not going to be targeting the posterior that we want. So you would think uh, at first glance. Turns out that if we can obtain an estimate of this marginal, which is unbiased, that's kind of easy and is positive, then the sampler will draw from the correct posterior. So all that we do is we just get an unbiased positive estimate of our marginal likelihood, just plug that directly into the acceptance ratio that defines our transition kernel, and we're guaranteed that this Markov chain will have as its invariant distribution pi of theta given y. Seems like magic, but it's actually fairly straightforward. Um, I'm not going to have time um, to, to describe the, uh, the rationale behind it, but it's extremely simple. Because you've got a Monte Carlo, in fact, let me just write it up, it's, 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 it's incredibly simple. Because you've got a Monte Carlo estimate, P of Y given theta, right? That's unbiased and positive. We've got a Monte Carlo error. And therefore, we can write this as P of Y given squiggle, where squiggle corresponds to a random variable associated with the Monte Carlo error. So what, uh, what this transition kernel is targeting is targeting the joint distribution, uh, is, sorry, uh, yeah, is targeting the joint distribution pi of theta squiggle y. And so marginally, the thetas are distributed pi of theta given y. It's as simple as that. Now, um, it turns out that uh, in the best tradition of statistics, this was an idea that was invented over 30 years ago in the quantum chromodynamics literature uh, in physics. And it took about 20 years for it to filter through to the statistics literature. But it's a great idea. Um, and, and it's really, really powerful. So if you bear with me for another, give me four minutes and I'll try and get to the punchline. That sound okay? The coffee's still out there. Okay, so the first thing we need to do then is get this unbiased estimate. Well, we can do that very simply by using important sampling. So we could just take any arbitrary distribution, right, draw samples from it, and then just use this plug-in estimate. And this will be unbiased. So that's all that we need. the efficiency comes in by using our machine learning approximations to f given y and theta. So we can use a variational approximation, an EP approximation, whatever approximation you want as our importance distribution to obtain our unbiased estimate and we can then just plug that in. And this is valid if we just use one important sample. So another way of looking at this is, is saying we, can, we have a way of removing the bias from these approximations to some extent. Um, so he, he, here's the scheme. We, we propose theta star from, from whatever proposal we want we then approximate our conditional posterior by whatever our favorite approximation is, EP. 
We then draw a number of samples of F from that. We then use those samples and Q via an important sampler to obtain our estimate of P hat. We plug that into our acceptance ratio. We're done. Um, we did a study, an empirical study of the uh, how good, what, what, what was the best approximation to use in the importance distribution. And it turns out the EP is actually really pretty cool. And here's some examples. So, so he, here's, here's an example um, with a data set, you know, just under 3,000 samples. So this, this is 3,000 samples. I'm not going to say it's high dimensional. Um, but if you look at the mixing of the Markov chain using, you know, a couple of the uh, reparameterization approaches that have been used, this is the auxiliary augmentation approach by Shaoli Meng, and this is the SURR approach by um, Ian and, uh, and Ian and Ryan. Um, and so you can see the, the level of autocorrelation is pretty grim. And if we use our pseudo-marginal, we get really nice mixing. So this is cool. And, um, and then in, in these plots here, we basically show that being a rigid Bayesian and marginalizing everything out properly, then when it comes to predictive performance, then we'll always... Well, for the data sets that we've looked at, um, it would seem that, you know, marginalizing everything, all our uncertainty, uh, using MCMC um, with this pseudo-marginal scheme um, certainly beats, so for example, EP, where we then just take the maximum marginal likelihood estimate of, of the hyperparameters. Um, yeah, this is the sort of thing that you would see at NIPS, I guess. So we published this. This is about to be published in IEEE Transactions, Pattern Analysis, and Machine Intelligence. And so details will be found in that paper uh, if you're interested. And if you still want to know about playing Russian roulette, well, you'll have to, uh, you'll have to figure that out somehow or other, because we're not going to do it today. <coughs> So let me just leave and close with uh, what I would have spoken about, playing Russian roulette. So thanks very much, and thanks for your forbearance. Um, let's go and have some coffee.